Okay, now that we're through the preliminaries uh, of talking about the nonlinear FEA in 1D, we're going to go ahead and start uh, in the next several lectures, uh, develop the total Lagrangian formulation and the, the FEA implementation of the solution. So uh, in this particular lecture, we're just going to start with the problem setup. Okay, so let me begin and just say, let's go ahead and consider a 1D rod loaded in tension. So let me draw the initial uh, state of this rod. And, and because it's a, a rod or a bar, it need not have a, a constant cross section, even though we're going to solve this as a 1D problem. Right, so let's say that it looks something like this, right? Uh, and the, we're going to solve it along, this is our x-axis, so we'll just solve it in one dimension and have the cross-sectional area be, be some uh, function of x, okay? So we could write this ac initial axis as x or also as the current position, c. So there's x evaluated, at, let's say, point a. Uh, we'll, that's going to be equal to zero. And then at this location, right, this has, let's say the rod here has a length of uh, L naught. Okay, then at this location here, this is going to be X, we'll call it this at location B is going to be equal to L naught, right? And then let's go ahead and define at this location uh, the, uh, the initial density. Right, we're not assuming anything here. The initial density is going to be uh, rho naught which will be a function of x, okay, big X. Remember, big X is the material position or the, the material point location or the Lagrangian coordinate, and C is the current position, okay? So let's now look at what happens in a uh, at, at some point in time, okay? Looks very similar. Sorry, forgive my drawing here. There's our axis that we're interested in. Um, and this is now the c-axis because we're in time. So this location here is ca is equal to zero, right? The current position of uh, a, this point up here, it still hasn't moved, right? And presumably here, cb, the current position of this uh, um, material point is now at l, right? And we can also maybe uh, define a function uh, for this uh, cross-sectional area. This is A evaluated at X, right? Maybe I'll call this A naught to just remind you that it's the initial uh, cross-sectional area. As I pull on this or change the, um, the dimensions, the cross-sectional area may change. Uh, and so we now have A as a function of X uh, and also T, okay? So we're interested in how that's changing. Okay, so then we also can talk about a current density. Okay, and this will be uh, rho, uh, now also of X, but of T. Okay? Okay, I also want to remind you at this point that Remember, we're talking about a total Lagrangian formulation. And if you remember what that means from the previous lecture, that means that uh, we're interested in taking our integrals and derivatives with respect to the, the uh, original material points uh, x, right? And so uh, we're going to try to formulate the entire problem uh, in, that, in that way, okay? And then if we want to describe a displacement, uh, we can. We can say that the displacement of some point x uh, is going to be given by the following. We'll say u of x and t, right? That's the displacement of, of the point x at any, any time. Okay? Okay, so now let's go ahead and uh, rem I'll just remind you of how we describe the motion of the body. So recall, uh, the motion of the body is given as follows. We would say C is equal to phi, that mapping function, which maps the material point X as a function of time to its current position, okay? We're gonna call that equation one. Okay, uh, and then kind of the, the corollary to that, uh, the material point 
uh, is defined as the, their their location their position in space in the initial uh, time t equals zero configuration. Right, so we would say something like x is equal to phi of x and zero. Right, it's the initial position. Call that equation two. Okay, how about the displacement? How do we define that? So remember from our previous lecture, uh, it's just the the distance between the initial position and the current position, right? So the displacement is given by, let's say, u is equal to c, the current position, minus the, uh, the original position, which we could also write as phi of x and t minus x, right? Call that equation 3. Okay, now I'm going to make you go back to a little bit of continuum mechanics. Um, we can define, remember, the deformation gradient. The deformation gradient was the, the partial of the current position with respect to, uh, if, we, if we had a differential um, length, let's say, uh, call it dx. Um, we want to know how the length of dx is changing um, during deformation. We have something called the deformation gradient, okay? So we in, in 1D, we define the deformation gradient as follows. We say that is f, that's our normal variable for the deformation gradient, is equal to uh, uh, partial, actually it doesn't need to be a partial in this case, well, since there's a time component, maybe we'll leave it there. Okay, partial of c with respect to x, right? So all that's telling me is how, how what's, the, what's a differential unit in the current space relative to the differential um, vector in in the original configuration okay which I could also write as uh, partial of phi with respect to uh, of x and t with respect to x okay call that equation four so if you if you're looking uh, and and you're thinking well I know what dc dx is that looks like the Jacobian you'd be right okay so in general uh, the Jacobian of a 1D mapping is going to be given by uh, J is equal to um, uh, the partial of C with respect to X, right? That's normally how we would define the Jacobian, okay? Okay, but for the purposes of this, um, uh, this, this problem and trying to maintain con consistency with when we move to 3D, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to define it as a ratio of volumes instead of a ratio of lengths, okay? So I'll just say, but uh, to maintain consistency uh, with later uh, multi-dimensional formulations, uh, we're going to define it as a ratio of volumes. Okay. So in this case, we'll say uh, J is going to be equal to uh, A times uh, delta C, right, over A naught times uh, delta x, right? That would be how we would do that. Uh, we have functions uh, that define a, and so we could write this, pull this out, a over a naught um, times, we can take the differential now, take the delta small enough, uh, something like that. Okay, and we know this uh, del c del x from equation four, so this looks like a over a naught times f. Okay, call that equation five. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at equation four. Okay, and I'll just say it's it. What do we what do we see? Well, what if there's nothing that's happening? If there is no uh, uh, no deformation in the material, then the differential uh, del c and the differential del x are going to be identical, right? So this quantity becomes one. So let's just say, um, uh, as is readily observed, uh, the deformation gradient F is unity or one uh, when there's no de when there's no deformation. Okay. So what that lets me do is introduce a strain measure. So I'm going to introduce a strain measure, uh, call it epsilon, such that epsilon is going to be equal to F minus one right 
maybe I should say f, and I'll remind you that f is a function of x and t uh, minus 1, right? Uh, so, so let's have a look here. Uh, what that means is that when there's no deformation, I expect my strain to be 0. And since there's at, at the time of no deformation, f is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. So at least that, that makes sense on its surface, right? Now, what, what does this also look like? Well, if I go back to my definition of displacement, um, I can, I can go back and, and show that, that the partial, this is equal to the partial of u, uh, with respect to x, right? If you need to see that, uh, just scroll up, right? So, uh, what, what is u? It's, uh, if I take the partial of u, with respect to x, this becomes partial phi with respect to x minus 1, right? This is partial phi with respect to x, which is f minus 1. So this is um, correctly uh, del u del x, okay? We're going to call that equation 6. So th this shouldn't surprise you, right? If you uh, remember anything from a uh, continuum mechanics course, you'll note that this is the equivalent of the normal engineering st uh, strain right, in the small strain case. So this is the uh, uh, del u del x, and that's cap x, okay? Okay, so what we've done is we've defined the problem, we've defined a couple relevant parameters, like the deformation gradient, we've now defined our strain measure, how about stress, okay? Let me just uh, now talk about that. So we're typically used uh, used to using the physical stress, right? Uh, which is is usually called the Cauchy stress, uh, and we usually denote that as sigma, right? Uh, as as a um, a measure of uh, stress. Okay, but in contrast, uh, for the total Lagrangian formulation, we're going to use the um, the nom what's called the nominal stress. Okay. So I'll just say, however, in a total Lagrangian formulation, uh, we use the nominal stress, uh, p. Okay. So let me let me give you the the formula for each. Um, I could define the Cauchy stress sigma is going to be equal to um, some uh, traction force uh, per unit divided by the area, right? Where this is my current area. And the nominal stress is the same force divided by a naught, but in this case, this is the undeformed area. Let's call this equation seven, and then we'll call this equation eight. So we can write that uh, we can. There's a relationship in this case between the nominal stress uh, a p and the Cauchy stress sigma, right? We could say that sigma is equal to uh, a naught over a times p, or we could go the other way and say that p is equal to a over a naught times sigma, right? Call that equation nine. So, uh, if I think this is this is pretty standard stuff. I, I, if you go back to you know maybe like a uh, properties course or your inter, uh, introductory mechanics course. We would typically call this the difference between true stress and engineering stress, right? So the nominal stress being the engineering stress because it's referenced to the the undeformed area, and then the true stress being referenced to the the current area or the deformed area. So in the case of the total Lagrangian, why why do, why are we using the undeformed area? Because we want everything to be with reference to the initial material point coordinates capital X, right? We're not trying to do it with respect to the current coordinates, so. Uh, our, our relevant reference is this a naught term. Okay? So that's uh, hopefully a quick overview of just the problem setup. What we're going to do in the next lecture is we're going to develop all of the uh, conservation equations uh, for the total Lagrangian formulation. Okay?